Hi, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. So without further ado, we'll get we'll begin. So anyway, again, welcome, everybody. Um, greatly appreciate you joining us tonight. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to share, you know, 2021, it's, it's great to turn the page and it's great to uh, be in a new year. Um, I'll say 2020 um, offered uh, an enormous amount of challenges, but it also um, allowed a lot of opportunities to occur as well. For me, um, I always had the desire to start my own business and to go out on my own. And 2020 gave me the opportunity to further dive into that and understand what that meant. I knew to do that, I needed to have three things. Um, I wanted to be different. So I wanted to differentiate my market and myself. Um, I wanted to find a great partner. And I know I needed to have uh, great next generation technology that truly could transform businesses. And so I didn't know where that business partner was gonna come from. Um, and I was fortunate enough to discover Valenta. And once we began to have conversations, um, it just came clear to me how Valenta can partner with their service delivery into all the channels that made sense to the needs of ophthalmology. And I'm really excited to present that to you today. So I'm a managing director with Valenta, which means um, I'm in charge and tasked with partnering with our practices and delivering solutions, but I'm also charged with expanding our team in, in the United States of America, which we're really poised um, to kick things off and to scale very rapidly. So who's Valenta? Um, we're a company that customizes solutions. Um, we're really focused on three main things. Um, one is process consulting. So what does that mean? Um, we're going to work with you and really understand your business. Um, understand where your challenges are, where your efficiencies could be better, um, where are you getting stuck, um, where the headwinds are in the industry, and how we can provide solutions to do this. So we're going to work with you from the very beginning of exploration into your challenges um, to the service delivery side of things, um, like a lot of big consulting houses would do. Um, the next thing is digital transformation, and that's a huge, huge thing, right? We've heard a lot of that buzzword, especially in 2020, when, when everybody had to do some sort of digital transformation um, to communicate with the outside world and with their patients. And, um, you know, we're going to focus tonight on some of the things that you may not have thought about um, and, and how that relates to your business. There's next generation technology that's actually available today. AI has been a, a big buzzword and we've seen a lot of movies about it, but it's here. Um, machine learning is here. Um, uh, process automation with robots is here. Digital marketing um, is here in a whole different way than you've seen before. So we're gonna cover those aspects tonight and we're gonna bring that um, to direct applications in the medical space. Um, and the last thing is outsourcing. So um, outsourcing is not yesterday's outsourcing, it's different. Um, it could be offshoring, nearshoring, it could be virtual assistants. And what we want to do is not take your staff and make them smaller. We want to take your staff and put them into positions where they're generating revenue for the practice in better ways and take those tasks that are repeatable um, and, uh, and often can have human error and either get them done in a more affordable way or even better, um, automate those things. So we're going to talk about that as well as a third pillar of what we're doing today. Um, Where's Valenta? So um, since 2014, um, starting in Brisbane, Valenta has grown into truly a global organization. Um, we're spanning five continents right now. Uh, we have five service delivery locations um, in Malaysia, in India, and the latest one in Trinidad and Tobago to support the North American time zone. Um, we also have managing partners in New Zealand, Australia, India, Europe, uh, Canada, and the US. And again, we're really scaling very rapidly. The model has been tested, proven, validated, um, we've got you know, happy customers and service delivery customers globally, and we are really looking to scale right now um, with your support. So who do we partner with? We can partner with almost anybody. There aren't many businesses out there that couldn't uh, gain and, and become better by um, having better process effectiveness or efficiencies, by having digital transformation, and by having um, the ability to, to outsource. The reality is that um, most businesses can't afford that. Um, prior to now, or very, um, very lately, uh, only the biggest Fortune 1000 companies could really afford this. The big houses are very expensive. And um, so, so there was a really competitive disadvantage for the medium-sized businesses to operate in the same economic conditions as the very largest customers who had economies of scale and great consulting. Um, that's not the case now. What we focus on is really the mid-sized business. So your business, your practice of 25 employees to 500 employees is really our sweet spot. 
Our goal is to deliver customized solutions to you um, that are personalized and meaningful to transform your business and give you the same competitive advantage as your largest competitors have. So tonight, we're going to focus on the medical area. Um, I have a passion for surgical ophthalmology, um, and we're going to focus on the healthcare sector. Um, you know, and just working with working with you and a lot of you in your practices over the years, um, we've come to identify a lot of challenges and, and, and boy did 2020 create a lot more challenges. Um, we had everything with COVID hit, you know, how are we communicating with our patients? How are we adapting to telemedicine and where is it today and where is it going to go in the future? Um, your reimbursement structure has not improved. Um, your profitability, um, it's probably more expensive to do business right now than it has been with, with additional protocols. So what does that all mean? What it means is that if we have a conversation, we can actually work with you and find solutions. And it, it could be in a lot of different ways, but we start with a process consultation and, um, and we'll work from there to find out where your challenges are. And then we'll plug in the deliverable services um, to make your practice run more, efficient, more efficiently, excuse me. Customer service, um, it's paramount to your practice. Your patients are rating you every day. Um, you're on all the social media sites and, and they're, they're talking about their friends, hopefully in a very positive way. It's the backbone of how you grow your business um, and, and, and the customer experience is here to stay for a good reason. Um, it's also incredibly important to us as well. We do weekly updates um, with, our, uh, with our partners, with our, the partners that we, we um, do service for. Um, we ask them, are we delivering the service um, to the level of your expectations? Are our projects being delivered on time? Are our services um, what we promised they would be? And um, in the overwhelming response is yes, um, they are. Um, we've got an incredibly high customer service rating um, and we take pride in that just like you take pride in that in your practices as well. So without further ado, I just wanted to kick off. We've got a great panel on the phone um, or on the, the call tonight, excuse me. Um, Jay Ashkazim is a, a co-founder of Valenta, and he's going to talk to you tonight about BPO, um, where it was and where it is today, um, and how we can apply automation to the, the revenue um, recovery cycle and medical billing. Um, Chayton Chasm, another co-founder of the company, is with us as well, and he's our digital transformation guru. He, he really leads the charge with automation and our service delivery um, in India, and uh, we're going to try to cram a lot of information out to you, but it's, it's really great, really cool technology that we can offer um, so that you've got a really good idea in terms of how, um, how wide our service delivery options are. And uh, Paul McLean is going to talk also about digital marketing. And I've had the opportunity to work with some world-class marketing people in my career. And Paul is at the very upper echelon of that community. And she's going to talk to you about some things that you probably know about already, but also some things that you probably haven't even thought about in terms of next generation technology interfacing with your digital marketing to make you even better than you are now. So without further ado, um, I'm going to kick it over to Jayesh. Um, Jayesh, it's yours to take away. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Alan. So, you know, I'll just start off with a little bit about, um, you know, BPO itself and its evolution, right? So, as you can see, you know, the industry started off in the 1980s, right? And when it first started off, it was more about business outsourcing. This was purely to take advantage of um, the cost savings, right? The uh, And having uh, offshore centers and so on as well. So, it started off in the 1980s. And as we progress towards, you know, the 2000s, you know, towards between 2005, 2000. Uh, 10, you know, it started becoming knowledge process outsourcing. So it, it moved slightly from, you know, the typical call center arrangements and so on as well to, to doing things that were more important, right? Um, again, freeing up people's time so they could focus more on business uh, development and uh, client facing activities and so on. And, you know, towards 2020, that's taken a complete different change as well. So this, is, this change has taken place between about 2016 to about 2020, where BPO has sort of evolved from being business process outsourcing to business process optimization and what this means is it's not purely an outsourcing play it's more about you've got the staffing but you've got the you've got the right processes so there's a lot about process consulting making sure that uh, you've got the right processes in place to take advantage of the best uh, of outsourcing solutions but also then automation right so if a process can be automated we should first be looking at automating it then outsourcing it so that's how the whole um you know the industry is evolved and we see that this this trend over here which is all about the business process optimization is going to continue in this um this way for the next five years now just going back to the uh to the origins back in the 1980s uh amex was the very first company uh from the us that set up an office out of india uh, you know this was back in the 1980s 
that you know, 10 years later, uh, GE, they took on, uh, they set up their, their locations. Now, you know, as these businesses, uh, global giants, you know, as they uh, figured out the best ways to take advantage of it, you know, slowly they will keep people within the leadership teams that left those organizations and set up third-party BPOs. So these third-party BPOs uh, started coming up in about two, uh, the early 2000s. And they were once again targeting the largest uh, players in the market. And you know, as time progressed uh, towards uh, you know, the 2010s, there were uh, third-party BPOs that were starting to focus more on the small to mid-size or the mid to mid, the mid-size space predominantly. And that's exactly where you know we come in as well as Valenta. So we set up in 2014. And you know, with this, we're a third-party uh, BPO focusing on the mid-size space. The way we look at it over the next few years is, you know, automation is going to be uh, very important uh, in terms of, um, you know, how businesses operate, especially after COVID. A lot of businesses have to uh, rethink about how their businesses are going to uh, work eff efficiently and more profitably moving forward as well. So that's where, you know, businesses have not had to think about automation. That's going to be very important. The success rate as well of implementing automation in-house is between 10 and 20 percent. And the reason for that is because of the knowledge gap. That, that exists in the marketplace. And therefore partnering with companies that have expertise in automation is the way to implement uh, automated projects or automated digital transformation projects. Nearshoring is another piece that is gonna become uh, even more important in the next uh, three to five years. And there's lots of uh, reasons for that as well with nearshoring, usually it's a better cultural fit, there's better communication, there's working the same time zones. And sometimes you know, it's also the bilingual uh, capabilities as well that help. And outsourcing, you know, which started off in the 1980s, isn't going to go anywhere it's because that industry has evolved. Uh, you know, when you look at offshore centers in, uh, in Asia and so on, especially when you look at India, there is millions of people that work in that particular industry. So there's a, a lot of domain expertise that already exists. Uh, and the same thing with automation as well. Uh, when we talk about automation, there's always going to be a demand for RPA developers, um, AI developers, and so on as well. And once again, you're going to need the, the right resources with the right level of experience to implement those projects. So outsourcing is here to stay as well. Very specific to the healthcare space is one of the functions is the revenue cycle management. And you know, revenue cycle management, you know, as most of you would already be aware, it's it's the it's all the administrative and clinical functions that contribute to the capture, management, and the collection of patient uh, service revenue, right? Um, once again, the large hospitals, uh, very similar to how MX took advantage in the 1980s, have already started implementing these solutions. Now it's about you know trickling it down to all the mid-size and even uh, localized practices as well. There's plenty of reasons, there's plenty of benefits in outsourcing the RCM process, but I won't touch on all of them. I'll just give you a very few, uh, maybe touch on about three to five. But one of them is, you know, with this, you know. Uh, practices, they get to spend more time uh, with patients, taking better care of patients. It's about increasing efficiencies within the practices. Um, very important is the denial management as well. Now, when you implement automation and you have the right staff that are looking after it as well, claims can be processed a lot quicker, the denials will reduce, and wherever there is a denial, it can be attended to really quick as well. This will reduce the overall uh, time in terms of the practices, seeing patients and getting paid as well. Um, obviously increased revenue, there's lesser administrative work, and there, there are a few other advantages as well, um, you know, which we can talk about in more detail, you know, uh, with a one-on-one -on -one consultation and so on as well. And, you know, just very quickly touching on a case study as well. So, you know, this is one of the recent practices that we've uh, just working with right now. We've finished phase one and we're going into phase two. So this is a set of clinic, um, you know, set up in the 19th uh, 1990s by two surgeon brothers. They expanded overseas in 2008, and you know, obviously set up um, to provide the best services, best values um, to their customers. But they did have challenges along the way. So you know, one of it was you know um, they didn't have an online um, booking form. Uh, they were using a desktop-based EHR. Uh, you know, patients would have to call through to set up appointments. Uh, they weren't utilizing the theaters and so on, all the resources within the practice um, to the best. And it was all because, you know, they had scattered systems and, you know, having uh, different sites uh, in different countries as well made it even more challenging. Uh, this ultimately led to obviously their uh, payments and so on as well, the delays in collecting the payments, but also delays in then 
managing their vendor payments as well. So one of so our approach in this particular situation was firstly understanding and mapping all the requirements of the clinic. Um, you know, we then identified the best platforms, the best vendors for that particular requirements. We then signed up with the right technology um, that the businesses needed. We then took care of migrating all the data and then go live. This included training as well as ongoing support as well. Now with this, there has obviously been a lot of advantages that we have achieved uh, for the business itself. So some of them is some of the very simple things such as you know getting a booking schedule straight away uh, from the website, making sure that it is uh, HIPAA compliant. Uh, you know we've integrated their practice management to their accounting and finance functions as well. So we go very good audit trails over here. Uh, we've made sure that all the patient information is located in the one area. So we've really built a very good ERP for them to run their entire organization, uh, entire practice. So there are plenty of things that we can do uh, for businesses, you know, starting with understanding where the business is today, how we can change, um, you know, how we can optimize the processes, implement automation and uh, add efficiencies. So that's pretty much um, you know, my session over here, uh, Alan, that I wanted to touch on today. Okay, great. Thank you, Jayesh, very much. Um, I can't see the chat going in right now, but um, but Paula or Chayton, um, is there anything in the chat or questions that has come up that um, we should reserve for Jayesh? Not that I can no? see, Alan, not currently, no. Okay, great. All right, Jayesh, I did have um, <clears throat> I did have a question um, that that came up beforehand, and and it was asking you to share your observations on the quality of service provided in the outsourcing space over the years, and why um, why we may be different than other people. Yeah, sure. So when it comes to uh, quality and so on as well, it's always working together uh, in partnership as well, right? Because everyone's understanding of quality or service requirements can be slightly different as well. So where we're very um, where we're slightly different, I'd say, is that we have you know local partners on the ground who work very closely with our clients, and more importantly, it's all the regular feedback as well. Uh, initially, when we're onboarding a client, we have uh, we have daily meetings. That slowly then transitions into weekly meetings. By the time we get into weekly meetings, we have very good dashboards. Uh, with our dashboards, and we track every we track every single job of ours as well. We ask our clients to rate us as well. Um, you know, based on the process, it could be a rating on every job, or it could be a daily or a weekly rating as well. And our uh, managers, our service de head of service delivery, and so on as well, they keep a track of that, and they reach out to clients if we see the rating anywhere below eight. So our aim is to always try and get up to 10. So, you know, that's one of the things that we actively uh, uh, work towards. And I suppose, you know, we've got, we've got our staff, we've then got managers, we then have head of departments, and then we have our local managing partners. So all up, there's about seven layers of QA uh, at our end. Awesome. Thank you, Jayesh. All right, uh, Chayton, um, please uh, take it away. Um, you know, we're talking about digital transformation and, um, you're up. Thank you very much. So oh, thanks so much, Alan. And hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking the time out again uh, this evening and hope you find this uh, session interesting. So it's all about digital transformation that I'm going to touch upon today. Um, it's a really interesting space. Uh, it's obviously been one of the biggest buzzwords probably, uh, you know, for the past four or five years and more so, you know, uh, during the pandemic. So, you know, words such as robotic process automation, machine learning, uh, you know, uh, artificial intelligence and, uh, you know, data science and, and whatnot, you know, so, so it's really, really interesting. And um, a lot of companies have obviously adopted this technology. I mean, uh, you know, globally, there's just over 15,000 businesses today that actually have sort of implemented an RPA process internally, right? Um, but here's the thing. Uh, out of those 15,000 businesses, you know, there is a massive failure rate. I mean, there's close to a 50% failure rate. And, and, and that's not really the, the fault of uh, the technology. You know, it, it's more to do with actually having the right process. Uh, it, it's more to do with having the right uh, workflows and so on. Uh, now, if you can think about it, uh, you know, and, and this is obviously something uh, interesting that I thought I should include over here, which was, uh, which, which was taken from Forrester, an independent research analyst. So, the technology, you know, for, so for every dollar spent on RPA software or on automation software, 
there's close to three and a half dollars that's being spent on services to sort of make that work, you know, and, 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 and this is interesting, right, because everyone can afford the technology, but can you really afford uh, the support services, you know, so strategy, uh, process assessment, prioritization, and so on, all that technically uh, eats into a fair bit. So this is where, um, you know, it's extremely, extremely important that you partner with the right companies, you know, because uh, more often than not, what happens when you technically reach out to a business, uh, you know, and this could just be for an initial consult uh, it's only once you actually discuss the various use cases the challenges that you actually uh, face that's when the company is actually trying to find another partner uh, you know someone that's actually got the experience in that particular space to sort of make it work um, you know so extremely extremely important that you find the right partners I mean you know, during this automation journey, uh, you know, like I said earlier on, 50% is actually the failure rate, but it isn't the fault of the technology. You know, it, it's worked amazingly well for the other 50%. They've really been able to scale this to a whole different level altogether. You know, so I think, um, yeah, uh, partnering with the right company is absolutely of a sense over here. And uh, yeah, if you could just move on to the next slide, please, Alan. Yeah, and, uh, you know, so it's just some interesting uh, facts again over here, you know, there's about 94%, uh, you know, that technically believe AI can give them a competitive advantage, you know, but again, the reality is only 50% have technically, you know, sort of achieved success over here. Uh, the failure rate's extremely, extremely high, and, uh, and, and which is why it all really boils down to a sound implementation plan. You know, and, and again, out of the 62 that have technically deployed an AI strategy, you know, there's only been about 13% that have probably been able to scale this beyond a point solution, you know, and, um, and, and with any business process, right, I mean, whether, you, whether you're talking digital transformation or whether you're talking outsourcing, staff augmentation, whatnot, uh, you know, it's extremely important to start with the pilot, right, I mean, something that you can test the waters with, and, and this is uh, where we believe, you know, uh, uh, you know, because digital transformation is just such a wide space, um, you know, obviously no one really understands AI, no one really understands digital, uh, you know, so it would make sense to identify a few areas, you know, something that is that is rule based, something that is repetitive in nature and start off with those kind of functions, you know, it could be something as simple as as a chatbot, right, uh, that could be your, your starting, your, the starting point with, with your digital uh, transformation strategy and you then sort of scale up, um, and you move on to other business functions, you know, around finance, accounting, human resources, IT, sales and marketing, and, and so on. So I think, uh, you know, very, very important that uh, you, you start off with identifying the right use case, something that is really bothering you, something that's really taking away a lot of your time, um, you know, in your day-to-day uh, uh, business, you know, uh, there's obviously a lot that you need to look at when you're sort of managing a practice, um, you know, sort of ensuring that your patients sort of happy, uh, you know, you're able to provide them with the right service, uh, ensuring that the follow-ups and so on are taking place at the right time, you know, so, so these are a few use cases that you can potentially consider. Um, you know, so finance and accounts is obviously one, uh, whether it's accounts payables, receivables, uh, you know, record to report, uh, information technology, you know, basic basic uh, tasks such as file and document management, uh, user setup configurations, uh, batch processing, um, you know, human resources. I mean, this is again, a very, very uh, interesting uh, area that you should potentially look at. I mean, if you're a larger practice and, and you do experience a high churn rate in terms of, uh, or, or rather a high attrition rate, you know, so a lot of things such as employee onboarding, offboarding, payroll, uh, you know, data management and, and so on. And again, with, uh, uh, with all the various cross functions, you know, there is a lot of data entry in any business, uh, forms processing, vendor onboarding, analytics. These are all areas that can potentially be automated, right, and uh, and save you a lot of time uh, and and money. Now, uh, obviously, a lot of businesses are moving towards, uh, you know adoption of virtual assistants or digital uh, or digital workers so uh, so let's just look at uh, some of um, you know the scenarios over here that intelligent digital workers can actually assist you with uh, so again you know it could be anything right from sales to marketing customer support uh, contact centers through IVR automation your 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 day-to-day -day operations HR ITSM 
So here's the beauty about automation, right? You, you don't have to restrict this to any one particular business function or, or it doesn't have to really uh, you know, start with, with one solution and, and just be limited to that. You can look at multiple different business functions. So all these are your horizontal areas, uh, you know, and, and as long as there is anything that is rule-based, uh, you know, the bots can easily sort of uh, adopt, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, to, to, to the day-to-day -day processing and, and save a lot of time. You know, so I'm just going to give you a very, very simple example over here, something that you probably relate to a lot better. And, and this is obviously not just, um, you know, with regards to the healthcare space, but more to do with banking. Um, you know, so for example, uh, you know, let's just say uh, a couple of years back, if, if you picked up the phone and, and sort of rang, rang the bank, um, you know, there, there's obviously going to be a human customer service rep at the other end. Uh, and, and you're just calling up to basically update your address, right? And, and here's the interesting thing. So the, the customer service rep on the other end is, is going to do just that. You know, you give them your new address and they will update it onto your system and you probably get an email confirmation, you get an SMS confirmation. But now what banks have technically started doing is they're using bots at the back end, right? So if, or, or they even have uh, uh, IVR automation. So technically you aren't really speaking to a human rep, you're speaking to a bot or, you know, you're sort of connecting to, to a bot through your bank portals and so on. Now, when the bot technically gets, uh, you know, a notification such as this stating that you're actually moving house. Now the, the bot's actually going to analyze a lot of other areas at the back end. you know, fair enough. So if someone's moving house, uh, you're going to go and check their current property valuation. You're going to look at the new suburb where they're actually moving to. And if that's a better suburb, well, there's probably three or four different things that have happened over here. Someone's inherited a lot of money. They've probably got a new job, you know, that there, there, there's, uh, they're, they're doing well in business. And which is why they're sort of looking to sort of move to a better suburb, move to a better home and, and whatnot. So what this technically opens up is a lot of other cross-selling, upselling opportunities, you know, for the bank, you know, so there could be an, 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 an option for a better home loan interest rate. I mean, you could look at insurance, you could look at, at multiple other aspects right financial planning becomes another area you know so there's a lot of uh, upselling and cross uh, selling that could potentially take place so that is just to give you an, an insight into the capabilities of a bot the human is obviously you know it, it's not that they're not thinking about it they just don't have enough time on that one particular call over say four minutes or five minutes whereas the bot can do this in in a matter of seconds you know so extremely extremely capable in terms of uh, you know how uh, robotic process automation or how digitization can actually help businesses sort of scale to a whole different level altogether now obviously in the healthcare space there's been a lot of uh, uh, there's been a lack of automation, right? Uh, obviously, some of the larger players in the market have have, have been able to sort of, uh, you know, adopt a lot of automation over the past four or five years. But the small and mid-scale firms are sort of still struggling. Um, you know, uh, there is a lot of unnecessary paperwork to deal with. I mean, uh, you know, even uh, the, the the post treatment and 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 care, uh, lack of follow ups, lack of personalization. Um, you know, as Jayesh also mentioned in 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 his slides. Um, you know, it's it's just the whole process of appointment scheduling. I mean, which kind of takes up a lot of time of the receptionist. You know, and then the lack of follow ups and so on. So these are all certain areas that could actually be automated. And and a lot of companies today have sort of implemented chatbots, right? But again, this is just chatbots sort of, you know, like working one way, which is inbound, you know, they, they're not really able to sort of do the second part, which is, you know, so once uh, an appointment has been scheduled, I mean, is the bot able to sort of auto trigger, initiate itself to sort of follow up with the patient, you know, make sure that they've actually got all the relevant information, uh, you know, for the surgery or, or anything for that matter, you know. Uh, so it's all about building that kind of, uh, you know, uh, customer centric uh, uh, department, which is which is practically impossible through the human workforce alone. So, you, and here's the thing: you're never going to be able to automate anything 100%, right? Uh, at at best, you're probably going to look at about 70 to 75 percent in year one. Uh, by year two, through constant machine learning, you'd get to about 80, 85 percent. Uh, you know, and by year three, you'd probably get to about 90, 95 percent if you've got a really strong um, uh, uh, a system working for you. You know, with strong business uh, process workflows and so on. And uh, these are just a few examples right now over here. So, you know, uh, scan documents and images without human intervention through optical character recognition, OCR. And, and obviously this is now moving to computer vision, you know. So 
uh, these, these are just some of the things that, uh, uh, you know, healthcare firms should technically consider going forward. <coughs> Sorry about that. Now, obviously, optimizing discovery and, you know, your appointments for patients. How do you technically make this a better seamless experience? Uh, you know, well, when someone's technically looking up the net, uh, you know, to sort of look at the, 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 the closest healthcare practice, the medical practitioner, they, they, they're sort of bombarded with, with, with a zillion different options on, on Google alone, you know, so for them to be able to reach out, sort of get to you, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's obviously not that easy. They've, they've got to take an informed decision and there's just so many options out there, you know, and, and this is where, I mean, by using automation, you can actually sort of, uh, you know, be a little different to what your, comp your, your competition actually has to offer, you know, so appointment booking with calendar, integrations it just makes your life a whole lot easier uh you know patient engagement uh accessing location information managing the wait list rescheduling all these are time consuming time cumbersome uh you know tasks and activities so if you can actually look at automating some of this by using you know robots or by using intelligent digital workers through conversational ai uh, it can actually free up a lot of your time so uh yeah the next slide please uh, just, uh, 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 yeah, we, we're just going to skip this, this particular slide because it, it's just covering a few other uh, cases in here. Uh, but, but again, uh, now this is something that we technically done for one of our clients, um, you know, which is, again, uh, in the pharmacy space. Uh, it was mainly around FAQ handling through document cognition, image processing, end-to-end -end sales tracking system. And probably the next slide would just give you a better insight into, uh, you know, what we've actually done over here. Uh, and, and, and this is what I was technically talking about in terms of conversational AI, you know, so it's not just your basic appointment scheduling, it's got to do a lot more than that, uh, you know, such as being able to relate to information for that particular uh, patient, obtain information from various third party applications, right, because it's not just your core uh, practice management software or your EHR that you're probably using, that there's probably, uh, you know, several other uh, applications that are currently in use. So so for, for a human to technically be able to go and obtain all that information in real time, well, it, it, it's, it's not an easy task. And, and there's always um, the element of human error. You know, someone is always going to stop up no matter how good they are. You know, you could just be... Um, you know, really press for time or, or, or whatever. And, and this is where, uh, you know, bots can actually uh, come in and play a very, very important role. So, so just an example in terms of the capabilities, really. Uh, Again, the, the good thing with automation uh, is, you, you know, language isn't a barrier. Now, you're probably dealing with patients that, that speak different languages. I mean, it, it's, it's not only English, right? I mean, you could have uh, customers, you know, uh, Spanish customers, Chinese customers, Indian customers, and, and whatnot. And, and the good thing over here is, uh, you know, through automation, you're able to support multiple different languages again you know there, there's there's several third-party integrations with all the big players out there in the market you know whether it's your salesforce your sap's uh your service nows and and so on so i think uh you know uh uh that this is the advantage, I mean, of, of technically using robots in your day-to-day -day business, in your day, you know, in, in all your different business functions, you know, as long as something is rule-based, it should ideally be automated. It, it's, it's what the competition is doing. It's what all the big boys are doing, you know, and I think there is no reason for the smaller firms not to technically implement this. Now, there's obviously a few challenges in here. Obviously, when some of the larger customers technically go down the automation path, you know, they have the funds, they have the money, they have the budgets, you know, to spend probably millions of dollars, you know, tying up with some of the largest customers, your Accentures and your Genpacks, the cognizance of the world to sort of, you know, build those kind of solutions. But even then, there is, again, a failure rate. So it, it, it's, it's not about just, you know throwing money at a, at a really big company and expecting them to sort of, you know, produce results. This is something that sort of works both ways, um, you know, and, and you've got to sort of think about it, uh, you know, because you can technically build an automation solution with as little as a thousand dollars a month, or it's going to cost you half a million dollars just to sort of build that internal capability. And even before you can start sort of discussing the various use cases and so on. So absolutely uh, vital to sort of, you know, partner with the right 
right firm, partner with the right consultant, uh, make sure they know what they're talking about, uh, get references, you know, I mean, because if you, if you go back to what I said a few slides earlier, um, you know, it's only when you reach out to a company that they're going to start finding the right partner to sort of build that solution with, you know, so you need to sort of speak to references, understand how they've technically implemented the solution, how the, how, how the firms actually work with them to sort of, you know, scale and, and so on. But I think, uh, yeah, uh, most automation solutions today come with enterprise ready solutions, you know, so they, they, they've got a lot of stuff in built through various connectors uh, and, 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 and stuff. So, you know, whether it's RPA integration, OCR image recognition, facial recognition i mean there is just so much to it so like i said very very interesting space and i can go on uh, you know for a couple more hours easy but obviously conscious of the time over here and 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 would want this to be a very very interactive session so probably you know if you do have a few more questions uh, you know that you've thought through uh, you know as i've sort of uh, been presenting we could again uh, touch upon those during the uh, during the q a but again yeah just to give you an idea these are some of the pre-built integrations that most of the rpa vendors most of your digital tools already have in place so you're not building something from scratch everything's already there it's literally plug and play but you've got to just figure out the smartest plug and play option out there right you could either go to a vwork or you could sort of go to a smaller serviced office now it's all about personalization. It, it, it's about a multiple different factors, um, you know, that you've got to take into consideration, make sure whatever is working right for you. Now, the reason I keep reflecting back on this uh, with regards to the failure rate, uh, and, and don't get me wrong, guys, it, it, it's not exactly, um, you know, about the failure that I'm sort of highlighting over here. I'm, you know, the other 50% that have technically been able to sort of use this technology to their benefit have absolutely taken the business to a different level. You know, they're no longer local or regional. They've just gone global because AI is scalable, you know, so it all really boils down to, uh, you know, making the right decisions at the start. And, uh, you know, if you can find the right partner to technically engage with, to work with, uh, this is absolutely going to blow your mind. And, um, you know, we sort of going to probably send through a couple of videos as well in terms of what we've done in the healthcare space, something that you will find very, very interesting, um, you know, and uh, and Alan will obviously sort of uh, touch base with you on, on that separately. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think uh, with that, I'm going to now pass this over to, uh, to Alan, um, and, and, and I hope you've sort of enjoyed the session, and I look forward to sort of uh, engaging with you further during the Q&A session. Alan, over to you. Great. Hey, Chayden, thank you very much for that. Very informative. Um, just um, you teased a, a little bit of um, uh, projects we've been working on that, that's probably really near and dear to this, um, the heart of this community, and that is um, is billing and claims processing. So can you share um, a little bit about the work we're doing on automating um, that process and in, in kind of what that could mean to these practices? Yeah, well, look, for a, a very, very simple example over here is, you know, a lot of practices obviously have the practice management softwares, the EHR applications, and then they're obviously using a different medical billing platform altogether, right? Now, just the data entry of this, uh, you know, sometimes with the humans technically processing stuff, it could it could very well take about you know, half a day or probably, uh, you know, for every single application, you, you're looking at probably spending 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, just toggling between screens, um, you know, uh, getting in touch with, with various departments, trying to obtain the right information, you know, so what we've technically done over here is completely automated the entire data entry process. And, and that is exactly the video that I was talking about that we wanted to technically uh, showcase over here, but we knew it was, was going to sort of eat into a fair bit of time. So, so if you could probably share that with all the participants, uh, you know, probably during your follow-up, I think that'd be great, uh, you know, but it, it's really about, and, you know, it's not just about automation over here, really, Alan, it, it's all about improving the process, ensuring that you're sort of eliminating that, that human error altogether, right? I mean, because, uh, you know, certain basic mistakes can actually lead to severe consequences over here. And, and as such, you know, the claims process isn't an easy one. Uh, you know, it is very, very time consuming. It eats into a fair bit of time for every practice over here, uh, even for the larger ones who have multiple, multiple resources to assist them with. So if you can look at, you know, streamlining some of that data entry, uh, you know, ensuring that information 
information is being uploaded into the right portals. Uh, you know, you can look at, uh, at batch uploads and, and all of that, you know. So, so these are just a few such examples that I can think of right now. But uh, like I said, there is just so much that we have actually done in this space that we would actually want to showcase to all the various participants, uh, you know, through a video that would give them uh, a, a better insight into the capabilities of the bot uh, in real time. Great. Thanks, Shane, very much. Yeah, group, just imagine, you know, taking your EHR and, and having all those medical benefit claims just um, auto upload it. Um, um, it takes about three to five seconds um, for all the data input, um, and there's no human error. So your denial and claims management um, processes is, is greatly reduced. Um, you can take the people that are doing that and just have them work on claims management and uh, and expedite the uh, recovery process for your practice. And absolutely, right, you know, cool. I mean, probably just to share, I mean, be very, very proud of the fact that, you know, during this entire period, uh, you know, during the pandemic, especially uh, with every single business that we've actually implemented RPA, no one's ever let go of an employee. Right. I mean, and, and that's a really good thing over here, you know, so it's not about replacing uh, your staff with bots. It's not about reducing your headcount. Uh, it, it's none of that. It's about getting them to do smarter work and let the bots technically take on, you know, all the repetitive functions. I mean, let them assist with, with the dirty work. You know, I mean, uh, the human mind's meant to do smarter things. Right. It's all about controlling the bot better. It's all about engaging with your customers better and, and just sort of, um, you, you know, improving profitability and productivity, you know, reinvest that money that you technically saved on admin uh, into digital marketing. It's just going to make so much more sense. And that's something that probably Paula can sort of discuss in, in further detail. Um, what, so yeah, over to you. What, what a segue. Um, so, so Paula, um, please uh, bring us home. Um, we're, we're really looking forward to hearing about, um, you know, where you think the space can grow and expand into, um, you know, in the next generation of digital marketing. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Alan. Um, so essentially, just leading off that outsourcing um, part that Jayesh was talking about. So we actually offer a digital marketing service within that. So that's actually a nearshore and an offshore solution. So it's a bit of a hybrid, which is um, slightly different to some of the other companies out there. Uh, but today, I really just wanted to educate everyone on why you would actually invest in digital marketing. What can you actually achieve um, what's the opportunity within the medical space, essentially. Um, but just touching on those benefits, because this is the main reason you would actually invest um, in digital marketing. Uh, but one of the major benefits that we have seen, so I have over 20 years experience, and when I first started, we did not have the analytics or the data to drive our decisions like we do today. So um, it just provides us with so much more opportunity for our clients to actually be able to gain insights into who their audiences are, build um, brand exposure with those insights as well. Um, also, just the analytics backing our decisions, it allows us to be far more agile. So within this space of COVID right now, um, a lot of businesses are getting enormous benefit from being able to dive into the analytics and actually change and optimize campaigns based on the campaign data that we're actually reporting. So businesses need to be more agile and they need to be able to understand that data and basically change far quicker than we've ever had to adapt before. So if we move across to the core components of marketing, I'm actually just gonna to touch on what I consider the core, three core pillars that every single business needs to invest in. So this is what I would consider your foundation level marketing. It has to be right before you can do anything else. So the first is brand. So clear brand strategy and messaging. You need to be looking at your unique selling proposition. So even if you are a local GP, you're within the medical space, um, you know, obviously you've got your geographic targeting that you can do, but you need to focus on your brand messaging. What makes you different to the local um, GP down the road? Why would someone come to you as opposed to someone else? Um, and this very much leads into website. So website is essentially your number one real estate um, positioning tool. It is the area where everyone's going to get the information they need to determine if they're going to utilize your service or your product, depending on what vertical you're within. Um, and the messaging needs to be clear. We need to have strong calls to action. So book appointment now. Um, we need to have those online booking systems like we were talking about as well to make sure it's automated and it's a functional user experience. Um, something also that I really want to touch on with website is speed. 
this is, if you were to do anything and look at anything within your digital marketing program, it should be your website speed. So it's actually shown that if your website loads takes more than three seconds, you have a 30% increase in potentially use, um, losing online users. Now that's absolutely enormous because these are consumers that actually want to use your product or your services and you've instantly lost potential clients. Um, you know, or patients. So website speed is definitely one of the biggest, most critical elements for absolutely every business. Uh, and what has been most interesting over the last 18 months is that Google is reporting that websites are actually getting slower. So whilst we should be looking at website speed and making sure that we're optimizing um, that as the number one goal, uh, websites across the board, according to Google, are actually becoming slower. So what we see a lot with our clients is they built a website three or four years ago. They haven't actually done anything. They might have done some content updates, but there's been nothing that they've actually done in the back end to make sure that the scripting's up to date, that they're doing their WordPress updates and so forth. So all of this is critical to um, your digital marketing strategy actually being successful. And that's why it's one of your core pillars um, to begin your strategy. The final third core pillar, sorry, Alan, if we can just go back, is actually just social. So social has become so important. Um, it's your way of actually building that brand credibility, actually having a personality. Um, doesn't matter which vertical you're actually operating within, if it's the medical space, if it's a different vertical, um, social just provides you with an opportunity for people to actually um, recognize that brand authority, build that brand integrity. Um, and actually social proofing, which is so important. So social proofing is essentially uh, using um, like someone else to actually validate your brand. So for instance, if I saw that one of my friends was actually following something specific on Facebook, it's instantly social proofed because I know my friend actually um, is testifying to that brand's quality. So I'm more likely to actually follow it. So this is why social is so important, even within the medical space. Um, and then just to sort of give you an idea as to the benefits um, and I suppose what you can achieve, um, I want to just show you a case study where a client that we've actually worked with, we implemented those initial three core foundational um, level marketing where we've actually focused on their messaging, USP. We've really done our competitive research. We've worked out how they are actually unique within their specific industry. So this is for an e-commerce store. So um, I like this case study because all of the data is totally um, transparent. So um, depending on vertical medium, sometimes we do have to make some um, like um, assumptions based on what we're doing. But with this case study, everything's transparent. Um, important to note, they didn't invest a huge amount in their digital marketing. So it shows how powerful it can be. So we focused on messaging, we optimized their website. Being an e-commerce store, they're actually on a platform that wasn't really supporting that. So we moved them to Shopify, um, which I'm not sure if anyone here has any knowledge of, but it is one of the biggest um, e-commerce platforms out there. Really great if you had a medical based um, e-commerce store, it would support it beautifully. Um, and we also worked on their social media to make sure it was up to date, it was um, regular and it was professional. So nothing too complex, but, um, off the back of that, we were able to build their database. We went into the advertising. So Google Ads has been absolutely critical for their lead generation. And we've also developed a testimonial program, which is like your social proofing again. So just to show you what the end result looks like, the client was actually after a 50% increase in online store sales by month three. What did we achieve? We've actually achieved on average over a 12 month period over a 300% increase in online store sales. So um, as you can imagine, the client was very, very happy, but it was all part of our process. So we follow a very stringent process as Jay Ash and Chetan have already spoken about with um, all of our clients that we work with. Um, we actually follow um, a specific process that follows stage one. Um, Alan, can we move to the next slide, please? Um, which follows phase one, which we call discovery. So essentially it is research and discovery mission for our digital marketing team. Um, we define and understand your um, corporate objectives, um, your point of difference, which is pod, 
um, your competitors. We do Google Ads audits. We do website audits, um, SEO audits. We do the whole full holistic approach. And then from that, we work across into our um, strategy. So audience personas, key messaging, what advertising mediums are we going to implement? What are the budgets going to look like? Um, so that's how we actually get to that point of success. And when we're executing and optimizing, we're really looking at those analytics that I was talking about before. So the implementation strategy has constant ongoing reporting. So we're reporting monthly and quarterly across different mediums to our clients. Um, and this is making sure that we're also optimizing correctly as we go. If there's any downturns or any course corrections, um, a lot of those have been made during the course of COVID. Um, with digital marketing. We have had to re-strategize. Uh, with this client I was doing the case study on, they actually have online, um, not only online stores, but they have branches. So we set up uh, very quickly um, non-contact pickup. So people could still actually go to the branches, but they would do non-contact pickup. So we set that up to be very fluid and to actually work um, within what, where we need to be agile. So that's sort of um, a very broad overview of sort of the digital marketing space. But you can sort of, you can sort of see it's moving very quickly um, and there's so much opportunity for businesses. Awesome, thanks Paula. Hey Paula, so just uh, for, the, for the group to understand, I mean, if you have um, opticals um, and, and you have other areas of e-commerce, whether that's uh, over-the-counter products, um, we can work with you for all those things, right? We can we can optimize that, like Paul was saying, we can do things on Shopify or other mediums um, to make sure that your customers can still find you and buy these products and safely pick them up um, even during the most challenging times. Um, hey, Paula, one question um, that was uh, pre-populated here was, um, where do you see chatbots interfacing with digital marketing and websites? The chatbots have become absolutely huge even in the last 12 months. So the chatbots to begin with, it was more um, human led. Uh, so that's sort of where the space began. And now we're seeing more and more websites um, that are using chatbots where we're actually automating them. Um, like, um, you know, we were sort of showing before too with um, different chatbots, you can um, really set up the process once we actually have the analytics to drive the decision making. We can set up the process for the chatbots so that we're essentially, we're not removing someone from the process because we've talked about, you know, we don't want to do that, but we're making it easier for the consumer to actually um, receive that information that they're looking for, which is absolutely critical. And there's actually, um, there's a lot of data right now to support that, um, you know, if you're in a service-based industry, like perhaps, you know, like the medical space, um, you know, chatbots would add great um, benefit to an actual website and increase your conversions dramatically. So there's definitely enormous opportunity there. Awesome. Thank you, Paula. Hey, and for the group today, um, thank you for joining us. Um, part of the offer of, of joining this launch is um, we, are, we are willing to um, extend a free operational analysis for your practice. So this is what we would do um, for um, process optimization and learning more about your practice and, and consulting on how to find better efficiencies. Um, normally it's on average about a $5,000 service that um, thanks to joining us today um, for this meeting, um, we are going to waive the fee for. So just please let me know um, if that's something you're interested in and we'll make sure that that happens and we'll connect in the short term future. Um, Q&A. So I'm going to just try to exit this screen and see if I can open my Zoom back up again, um, which I cannot. Alan, um, we've got a Q&A from Robert Nelson, um, who has asked, why ophthalmology? Why now? What has been your prior history in healthcare? Great. I don't know who that's fielded for. Um, I think it might... Perhaps um, either you or Jayesh, I think, would be suitable. If you want to okay. take it there, uh, Alan, I'll, I'll continue. Yeah, so um, so in terms of the, the ophthalmology healthcare space, I mean, I've been working closely with practices for a, a number of years now. And um, I think as I've met with um, a lot of practices, um, small, medium, and large size practices, and a lot of private equity providers as well, you can see the transformation of what needs to happen in these practices. They need to become more efficient. They need to become more automated. 
Um, the back office channels need to be consolidated and made more efficient um, so that the practices can operate at a higher profit margin in a declining reimbursement structure. So, um, so where, where I see a lot of the benefits that we can bring to ophthalmology are you know, really looking at practice processes. There's a lot of consultants out there who are really, really smart that we can work with as well um, and partner with. So if you've got a consultant that currently works with you that you, um, that you really trust and really love, then that's great. Um, we've got the service deliverables that we can actually extend on top of those services to complement their services. Um, but I think, you know, there's a lot of things that we haven't thought about in terms of automation and a lot of things we haven't thought about in terms of how we're going to staff our practices that we've had to think about this year um, because we've had to, we've had to pivot. We've had to change um, who's coming into the office and who's going to work virtually and how many patients you can see in a day safely. And it's really made us think about what the whole paradigm change is going to be and what the future is going to look like and integrating this technology um, and having options in terms of staffing that's on site, that's virtual, um, that's a hybrid um, is really something that, that, that everyone can benefit from. And one of the things we really didn't even talk about were virtual assistants. Um, and just imagine having you know, a right hand or a scribe or, or someone that, that, that you can work with virtually um, because they can't come in or because um, they're sick or because your staff is, is just, uh, the dynamic has changed and you've got to move staff to one location um, to, to serve as customers, but you're short staffed in another one. Um, there's, there's a lot of application and the time is right now to, um, to integrate technology into practices in a way that we just haven't seen before. Jay Ash? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Alan. And look, in terms of timing as well, you know, just in uh, 2020, you know, there's been uh, a lot of activity, right? A lot of hospitals are uh, taking advantage and um, using these services and utilizing it. You know, some of them, such as, you know, VCU Health Systems in Richmond, uh, the Summit Healthcare, um, there's a Fairfield Medical Center. Um, you know, there is a pl plenty of them that have actually made some big decisions, big changes. Uh, you know, some of them have looked at about, you know, 500 positions, you know, uh, in their IT and finance teams that they've started looking at outsourcing and so on, all this in the last 12 months. Now, when you take this and you add automation as well, you may not need 500 people, you may need about you know, 100 people. And then you may need about 100 bots, you know, I mean, to achieve the same level of service, but at a way quicker speed as well, right, without any errors. So I think the time is right now, you know, what I mean, especially with everything that's happened in 2020, uh, in 2020, um, you know, to, to set ourselves up for the next five years. I think now's the time to start making all these uh, important transitions. Things don't happen overnight. Um, you know, depending on the size of the process uh, and the size of the organization as well, it can take anywhere between, um, you know, three months to six months for a successful uh, transition and implementation. If it's a smaller process, it can be done between one to three months. Uh, but when we're looking at a, um, a holistic approach, which starts with uh, process mapping and so on, you're looking at three to six months for a complete uh, small transition. Excellent. Alan, we Thank have... You, one more question, if we have time. Um, uh, another one from Robert Nelson. You offer a broad scope of services. Are those services outsourced or have they been developed and managed in-house? That's a great question. I'll let uh, Chayton and Jay Ash um, handle that one. Sure. Um, Sorry, I was just looking at another question as well uh, that came in. Yes, so we do have a broad range of services, right? And we, when we first started, when we looked at it, you know, we started off purely as outsourcing and we then added consulting and then we added automation more recently. And we've sort of diversified our um, the industries as well in which we started. We started off in financial services and today we offer it across 13 different industries. Now, the reason why we've done this as well is for us, it's all about making sure we're looking after our clients and providing them a holistic solution. If we were just looking after one area, we would not be doing the right thing for our clients. And there is always a um, loss in transfer when you're dealing with multiple vendors and so on as well. So we like to work with our clients in looking at where the business, what are the business goals, what do they want to achieve? Once we understand that, we can sort of customize all our services and tailor make it around it. Now, we have a lot of internal capability. Um, all our resourcing is all in-house. However, when it comes to automation, we use, we partner with the right technology providers. So for example, right, there's platforms such as Salesforce. Now, if you're looking at a CRM, you would look at a platform such as Salesforce, you'd look at like an SAP, you'd look at Oracle and so on as well. So our benefit is that we're sort of agnostic, right? So once we understand the, the requirement, we will implement the right technology for your business. Sometimes we may implement multiple technologies as well, right? For the same solution, just to minimize risk 
as well. So I think that's where um, we come in. But yes, look, our teams are all internal. And if we do need to engage uh, external consultants uh, for a very specific niche, we would. We have very good relationships in place um, to take care of that. But our local managing partners, uh, managing directors will always maintain uh, the relationship with the client and project manage to make sure that everyone's on the same page and the client's getting what they need. Chetan, is there anything that you'd like to add to this? No, look, I think you've sort of covered everything uh, really well in there. So, uh, so now, not, nothing more from, from my end. Great. Thanks, Jayash. Thanks, Jayash, okay, you said there's one final question. Yes, there is. We do have one question, and this is, do you think that COVID has caused businesses to be more open about digital transformation and outsourcing? Right, and uh, maybe I'll take it. Right, uh, so yes, if you look at you know what's happened in the last in the, in the past twelve months, a lot of this. So digital transformation was a good to have project. Right, uh, if you look, if you spoke to uh, the C level teams, they probably had it in the three year or a five year vision, but didn't really know how to get there. Right, and it was not a high priority. But last year, towards uh, March and April, it became a very very high priority. So that fast track things and the same thing with outsourcing as well it's not necessarily a new thing and today you know when people are working from home it doesn't matter where the person is working from what is really important is do you have the right skill set um, to do the job that's more important you know i mean it shouldn't really matter where the person is working from and we are working in a global village today at the end of the day right so so yes to uh, answer your question um Yes, businesses are more open towards digital transformation as well as outsourcing. Everyone's interested in being in business for the long term, uh, in making sure that they're looking after their clients and being profitable at the same time. Alan, on to you. Yeah, thanks. And I, I think I'll just um, add to that. We, we've known of multi large multinational companies who have actually greatly accelerated that process. Um, because of COVID, um, it was in the long-term plans, like Jay Ash was intimating, and um, and they just rapidly accelerated that because they could see the the more immediate need um, happening today. Um, so with that, we're we're a little bit over an hour. Thank you so much for everybody for participating. Thanks for your questions. Um, if you have any further questions, please email me. Um, I'll make sure that if I can't answer them, that um, that the, the people on the call um, tonight, the webinar tonight, um, are, are open and accessible um, to answer those questions for you as well. Um, look forward to speaking with you and seeing you in an environment um, where we can meet one another, um, not only virtually, but also in person sometime soon. And, and I hope that everybody stays safe. Um, and, uh, and I wish all the health and success for you and your families. Good night, everybody.